How's it going everybody? Chaotic Meatball here and welcome back to the channel. So today we are going back to the dreaded Generation 8. Yeah, I know I said I was probably going to go back to this game never, but hey, I wanted to give it another shot. Since my first and only playthrough was the Professor Oaks challenge, and I don't think that's a fair way to assess this game, so here we are. We'll be using exclusively Steel-type Pokémon for this hardcore Nuzlocke. So we've got Corviknight, Bisharp, Ferrothorn, Aegislash, Bronzong, Clinclang, Galarian Stunfisk, Berserker, Lucario, Excadrill, Steelix, Caparaja, Durant, Togedemaru, Mawile, Escavalier, and Duraludon. That's right, 17 entire encounters, almost enough to fill three entire teams, and nothing's off limits here. Even the trade evolutions of Steelix and Escavalier, they're both obtainable in max raid battles in the wild area, so I'll be able to get them, though Steelix is a 3 star raid and Escavalier is a 5, so they aren't available extremely quickly. However, a good number of these encounters are available before the first gym, so I'll be having a great time. Also, in order to have a harder time with this run, I made sure to choose Sword version so that I'd have to face off against B instead of Alistair the Invoker as my fourth gym leader, since Pawniard would totally rip through the ladder like an Ash Blossom negating a magical meltdown surge effect. The rules of this run are simple. If a Pokemon faints, it is considered unusable and must be permanently boxed. I can only get the first Steel-type encounter per area. No items in battle, held items and items outside of battle are allowed. I must play on set battle mode. I can't use Dynamax or Gigantamax in battles involving progression, but for grinding in dens and such, it's fair game simply to move the game along. And I'll be following the level caps on screen. Remember to click that like button, I'd love to see this video hit 3,500 likes, and subscribe since we're only around 6,000 away from 100,000. Thank you all again very much for getting this channel to this point, and let's get straight into it. So, the beginning of this game is slow. Very slow to say the least. And for someone that attempted to do this game in a sleep lock setting, that is not helpful whatsoever. But after handling the cutscene in Wedgehurst, I'm able to pick up a starter. I choose Grookey here because I want Leon to have an additional fire type in the final battle to make it harder, with Hop choosing Sobble. With the encounter with Zashin completed, I'm able to finally make my way to Route 1 with Pokeballs in order to get my first encounter in Rookity. This evolves into the flying and steel type Corviknight, but I'm not going to be allowing myself to use it in battle with the exception of this little stretch between now and the wild area since I can't get a full on steel type until then. I also decided on the nickname theme of Heroes from Yu-Gi-Oh! So Elemental, Evil, Destiny, Vision, Masked, all heroes are fair game here. So I grind up to level 6 and challenge the first trainer on Route 2 and yeah, I had a feeling that wasn't going to go well. Mind you, I actually did an attempt that made it to Kabu before trying this as a sleep lock, so it's not like I straight up just lost to the first trainer in my first attempt. So I reset, went ahead and trained to level 7, making a concession with chat that I would be allowed to reset at the Wedgehurst Pokemon Center since they didn't want to sit through the half hour of intro again either. Fair enough. With Rookie D at level 8 though, I was safely able to get it through the trainers, making it to the end, meeting Professor Magnolia and challenging Hop straight after. He's got three Pokemon here in Wooloo, Rookity, and Sobble, so he'll be a bit of a challenge with only one Pokemon. He starts off with Wooloo, so I decide to go for Hone Claws, boosting my attack and accuracy three times, taking two of Wooloo's tackles and a growl to put me back at plus two. This should be enough to sweep though, so I use Power Trip to take out Wooloo, leading to Sobble. I try this once again, but Sobble outspeeds and lands Water Gun for a good amount of damage before being one shot with Power Trip, leaving just his own Rookity. It's only level 5 though, so one more power trip does it in, winning us the battle. I can't believe we're already just sweeping teams with setup moves without even having the first gym badge, but believe me, it's gonna get a lot worse later on, trust me. Now that I've been given the endorsement, the Wishing Star, and the Dynamax fan though, I'm finally able to retreat back to Wedgehurst and take the train to the wild area where our first few encounters reside. Sadly though, while trying to get some EXP candies to level up Rookity and get it to evolve before searching for our first encounter, it got KO'd by an errant max rockfall from a Togepi. Well, back to the Wedgehurst Pokemon Center we go, and at least it's not too much time to get me back up to the wild area, taking out Hop once again and making sure to not fight that thing again since I know what it has. Instead, I take out Dens with a Hoot Hoot, Ninkata, and Choodle in order to get enough EXP candies to evolve Rookity into Corvusquire, which should give me a strong enough Pokemon for these encounters. 
well, first encounter, since I'm not going to be able to use it after I get an actual Steel-type, first of which being Onedge from the Watchtower Ruins. This is the only Steel-type in the area since the den I got it from houses Ghost-types, which was perfect for finding it. Second up was Ferroseed in the Dappled Grove from a Grass-type 10, again ruling out other encounters, and Riolu over in the Giant Seat thanks to a rare raid den. I also allowed the use of the Raid Den exploit in order to get the run moving, but I'm not content with my encounters just yet. Over in the Stony Wilderness, I'm able to find a Steel-type Den that gives me Bronze Ore, which should be my last Wild Area encounter for the time. I don't want to risk getting Clink or Meowth here with the other Steel-type Dens, since I can get both of them on Routes 3 and 4 respectively, both before the first gym, so it just doesn't make sense to pick them up. Instead, I make sure to cook a bunch of curry and level up Riolu with EXP candies during the day to get an actual Steel-type in Lucario. And then I got an idea. Why not just use the Rare Raid Den exploit over and over again and finalize movesets for my Pokémon before the first gym? That would totally allow me to finish the game in one sitting, right? Well, it certainly helped since mapping out my encounter's final Eevees and movesets was pretty easy. But getting all of the TRs for this, though? That was another story. This took a good few hours just grinding watts from my early game encounters, but it was definitely worth it since I was able to set up Lucario with Calm Mind, Aura Sphere, Flash Cannon, and Psychic, On Edge with Sword Stance, Shadow Sneak, Aerial Ace, and Close Combat, and Pharaoh Seed with Seed Bomb and Gyro Ball since both Protect and Attract are TMs up in Modestoke, not far from where we are now and before any major battles. With all of that in hand, I'm able to head into Modestoke, take out Team Yell, which have the best grunt battle theme in the series, don't at me, take part in the gym ceremony, and head over to our next battle with Hop just before Route 3. He once again leads off with Wulu, so I go with Lucario, using Calm Mind three times before firing off an Aura Sphere, Psychic, and another Psychic to KO Wulu, Sobble, and Rookity respectively winning me the fight. Yeah, if you watch my Legendary speedrun videos, you'll know the power of Calm Mind is truly absolute. And being able to abuse it with a fully evolved Lucario this early in the game is one of the most gratifying things I'm sure I can do. Moving on, I'm able to grab Clink on Route 3, as well as Drillbur from the Galar Mine, before being interrupted by Bead before getting my next encounter on Route 4, so I figured I'd pummel him real quick with Stratos the On Edge. He leads with Solosis, so I just used a single sword stance, using Shadow Sneak to sweep his Solosis, Gothita, and Hatina with one shots winning me the fight. Despite Shadow Sneak only being a 40 power move, the priority that it gives me along with Stab is just such a useful addition to the arsenal that I can't help but keep it over something else like Shadow Claw that may be a bit stronger later. Moving on to Route 4 though, I'm able to get my Galarian Meowth, finishing off every encounter I can get outside of the wild area, but that still houses one more in Pawniard. Despite this, I decided to hold off since it doesn't evolve until level 52, and I already have a full team, so to the first gym we go. Milo should be easy enough thanks to On Edge and Aerial Ace, but let's see. He leads with Gossiflor, so I set up two Sword Stance through two Magical Leaves, taking it out with an Aerial Ace and leading into Eldegoss. This is his Dynamax Pokemon, increasing his HP, but that shouldn't do enough in the face of Aerial Ace. Shockingly to me though, it outspeeds and nails max overgrowth, barely not KOing on edge as I follow up with Aerial Ace for around two thirds. I probably should have looked at this thing's base stats since I'm not familiar with many of the Gen 8 Pokemon stats, but hey, at least we still have on edge, following up with Shadow Sneak next turn to get that priority KO and the Grass Badge. I'll have to be a little bit more aware next time since I do not have the familiarity with this game that I have with Gens 1 through 6, but that's what makes it a little bit more fun than usual. After this though, it's time for some EV training. The level cap goes up to 24, and since Gen 8 goes on a similar EXP system to Gens 5 and 7, I should get a lot less EXP from Route 1 and 2 Pokemon. Also, since there's no EXP share, rather than all Pokemon getting EXP from a battle, with the lead it gets 100% and the rest get 50%, so it is sort of like the old EXP shares, we just can't turn it off, which is very irritating for a Nuzlocke with level caps. But fortunately for us, Everything that gets EXP gets EVs, so I just separated them into groups. On Edge, Lucario, Meowth, and Drillbur for speed with Rookadees on Route 1, Meowth, On Edge, and Drillbur for attack with Choodles on Route 2, which hilariously enough, I got a weird glitch while EV training here, somehow getting on the bike by walking just right on the bridge leading to Magnolia's lab. I honestly didn't know this was a thing before it happened, so I had a pretty good reaction to it on stream, but it went away after my next battle, so it was fun while it lasted. 
I was hoping it was akin to the glitch with Rush Jet in Mega Man 3, where once you glitched the item into existence, you just had it from then on out. But alas, this is a Switch game, not an NES game. It's not meant to be. Moving on, I used Oddish in the wild area on Lucario for special attack EVs, though they were a bit too high level to get too much out of them, and Metapod also in the wild area for Pharaoh Seed, Clink, and Bronze Ore for defense, as well as Baltoy in the same group for special defense. Looking back at it though, I probably should have used the Nickets that were on Route 1 for special defense, but hey, hindsight is 2020. By this point though, I was starting to get tired since I was around 16 hours into the stream and not even at the second gym yet, so I figured it was time to move on, blasting through Route 5 and meeting Hop for yet another battle. He's got a bit of an upgraded team fortunately, though leading once again with Wulu. Instead of going straight for sweeping though, I led with Bronze Ore, setting up Reflect and attempting to put it to sleep with Hypnosis before setting up my sweep. But it took a whole 6 uses of Hypnosis to finally hit this bugger with the GTS. Frustrating, and it should have been a sign of things to come, but that's fine as I swapped out for Meowth, setting up two Sword Stance and hitting Metal Claw for the KO, leading into Drizzile. For some reason, it uses Round, which is resisted, and giving me a free turn to hit Play Rough for the KO, leaving just Corvusquire. It's outsped and hit with a Play Rough to KO though, so no need to worry. It gives me a revive for beating him, may as well just give him me a small stack of money, bud, letting me move into Holbury and the gym battle with Nessa. Since I had the Miracle Seed though, I figured I'd give it to Pharaoh Seed to boost Seed Bomb, since her team should be a cinch with that. I also made sure that it would have Ingrain and Harden to set up on Aracuda, just in case Dynanax Dreadnought somehow could blast me hard enough, but that would come back to bite me. Her first Pokemon went smoothly enough, as I was able to KO Goldeen with a single Seed Bomb after Whirlpool leading to Aracuda. But here's where the problem came in. Iron Barbs was whittling down her HP, sure, but every bite kept flinching, disabling me from being able to sit up in Rain and Harden. Not to mention, I was getting pretty damn tilted and tired at the same time, and not thinking because of it, I kept going for Ingrain. You know what Ingrain's downside is? I can't switch out anymore. And with the one free turn that I got afterwards, I was only able to set up a single Harden. Yeah. Aracuda managed to flinch Pharaoh Seed 8 out of 10 times, meaning that Dreadnought was free to come in, Dynamax, and KO my completely weakened Pharaoh Seed, leading to the first death of the run. Extremely frustrating to be sure, but I was able to just go into my Lucario, hit two Aura Spheres, KO, and win the battle. Seriously though, a Grass and Steel type was completely obliterated by a Water type that just so happened to get literally 80% flinch chance. I think this game specifically wants me to hate it. With that said, I was able to continue into Galar Mine 2, taking out the battle with Bead thanks to On Edge and a few plus two Shadow Sneaks to Solosis, Gothita, Hatina, and the new Galarian Ponyta, but I was too angry to continue. So with the capture of Stunfisk, breaking the nickname theme to name it the this game because seriously, I can't stand it, I lost the sleep block, but continued the Nuzlocke nonetheless after a few days of rest and recuperation. Getting back into it, I immediately EV trained Stunfisk with 252 HP, 128 attack, and 64 defense and special defense EVs as my spread. This thing is going to be my main out to Kabu. Since the level cap is too low to get Excadrill, this will be my only steel and ground type. I even did some calculations, yes, Chaotic Meatball doing the damage calculation in order to ensure that I could win. A surprise, I know, but I think it was well worth the effort in order to continue with the run. I even made sure to grab some Aka Berries from the Wild Area, as well as the Light Clay from the Digging Duo so that Bronzor would be able to set up screens and maximize the time with them, then set up Safeguard and give Stunfisk a chance at sweeping. But before we get him, Marnie's in our way for the first time, and we gotta get stomped. I mean, we need to stomp her. She leads with Krogunk, so I go with On Edge, and since the only attacking move she has to hurt me is Sucker Punch, I just use 5 Sword Stances to nullify its power points, using Aerial Ace to KO and leading to Scraggy. Aerial Ace does the job as well, leaving just more Peko, and I try to go for Shadow Sneak here. It doesn't KO though, since it's resisted, even though I am plus 6 with Stab but Morpeko's not able to KO with Bite, so after a form change, I'm able to hit a second Shadow Sneak to get the win. Alright, adding back in Lucario and Stunfisk into the party, it's held item prep time. I gave Bronzor the Light Clay, Clink the Leftovers, Stunfisk the Akaberry, Onage the second set of Leftovers, Meowth the second Akaberry, and Lucario the third Akaberry. 
I should be fine here, though I'm still expecting pretty heavy losses. At least three members. Kabu leads with nine tails, so I go for Bronzor and attempt to fire off Hypnosis, since she has Fire Spin and I do not need to be locked in here. With that, I'm able to put her to sleep as she uses Will-O-Wisp, burning me, but I'm able to set up my safeguard afterwards. But he wakes up as I go for Reflect, hitting an Ember for around a quarter as I use Light Screen on the second Ember. Here I'm able to swap out into Lucario though, since I'm saving Stunfisk for Gigantamax Centiscorch. Taking an Ember for only 6 damage thanks to the Light Screen and Akaberry, giving me ample time to go for Calm Mind, setting up one of them before Safeguard runs out. This was planned as well, as Lucario isn't affected by this physical attack drop since we only have special attacks, meaning I could force in a status move and not get too much damage on me as I use the second Calm Mind. The third comes out as she uses Fire Spin. Not a good thing for me, but it doesn't do much. With plus three special attack though, I'm free to fire off an Aura Sphere, KOing and getting rid of the Fire Spin lock as Arcanine comes out second. Intimidate means nothing for me as I just fired off another Aura Sphere for the KO, leaving just Send a Scorch. I've got to get three turns of survival out of this thing before I can handle it because it gets out of G-Max, so I'm expecting two to three deaths here. First of which is Meowth as I swap it in to take the first G-Max sent to Furno, Alkaberry and all still KOs. Sad, but fortunately though, I made sure to give Clink Protect so it's able to survive the next G-Max sent to Furno, and somehow the second Protect actually holds up, finishing off his G-Max form and still being alive. I was gonna swap here, but G-Max Centiferno also has a Fire Spin locking effect, leaving Clink for dead. Though I did attempt to go for Power Gem here for the quad super effective damage, it got outsped and destroyed. Unfortunate to be sure, that definitely could have put a good hurting on him, but with that down, I went into Stunfisk, debating between Surf and Earthquake. I'm thinking it's gonna burn me, but at the same time, Earthquake is just much stronger as Stab is a thing, and Stunfisk's physical attack way outweighs its special attack, so I said screw it and went for Earthquake, taking a flame wheel for very minimal damage and doing exactly half with Earthquake. I was hoping for a good range here on the second attack, but he survives, hitting a second flame wheel as I expect a hyper potion, but he doesn't go for one, instead going for smokescreen, which isn't enough to make Stunfisk misc, letting me finish it off with Surf and win the fight. So long Meowth and Clink, at least the former of you gets to evolve into Berserker despite fainting. With the third gym badge in hand, my level cap shoots all the way up from 27 to 36, so you know what time it is. Excadrill's about to come out to replace one of my party slots, using a few EXP candies to get it. And since I've got a moveset of Sword Stance, Earthquake, Poison Jab, and Iron Head, this thing is literally going to be carrying the rest of this run. There's still another blank spot on my team though, so I think it's time for a few more encounters. First of which is Q-Fant over in the bridge field as well as Pawniard in a den from Westlake Axwell. Lastly, over in Hammerlock Hills, I'm able to get the 3-star Steelix. It's a bit too high of a level for now, so I just fill the empty slot with Qfant, moving over to Route 6 after handling some boring stuff in Hammerlock. Durant's available here on Route 6, which unfortunately has the Hustle ability, so it isn't going to be the most reliable thing, but when it does connect with attacks, boy howdy, it's going to do some damage. Nothing else much to say other than we've got another battle with Hop outside of the Stoan side gym, and he's actually revamped his team quite a bit here. Before fighting him though, I made sure to evolve Bronze Ore into Bronzong so that I'd have a bit more of a good defender, so let's take him down. He leads with Cramorant here, so I go for On Edge using Sword Stance twice, as he does around a third with Dive. KOing with Shadow Sneak, and since I have no idea what Cramorant's gimmick is, it somehow does damage with the Aracuda in its mouth before going away, leading to Silicobra. It's a one-shot with Shadow Sneak, same with Drizzile, leaving just Toxel to fall to the same fate. It's cool that he's got three new members, but I would have appreciated him having both Double and Corvusquire here as well, so that he'd have a full team of six. Seeing that this early on in the game definitely would have given this game an identity akin to a Black 2, White 2, or an Ultra Sun and Moon in being relatively difficult in terms of story for a Pokemon game. Before entering B's gym though, I made sure to get some more EXP candies from the wild area, since those things are fantastic for edging, and since in Sword and Shield, you have to complete the entire gym, including beating the leader before you can leave. So, these things help me give what I could do in other games, instead of being able to just do it like I could. Where I could just leave the gym, edge, and then fight the leader, but you know, Sword and Shield is Sword and Shield. 
Anyway, B leads off with a Hitmon on top, who happens to not have a single way of hitting my newly evolved Dewblade. So I'm able to set up three Swords Dances, sweeping through her Hitmon on top, Pangoro, Surfetched, leaving just her Gigantamax Machamp, which also just goes down to Aerial Ace. Yeah, I'm telling you guys, the Staples button is a good idea for these moments. That team just got swept! That was easy. There may not be many areas between now and the next gym, but there is a battle against Bead before the Glimwood Tangle, so let's take him out real quick. He leads with Duosion, so I go for Excadrill, since that thing can't really hurt me. Using two sword stances as he sets up Light Screen and lands a Psy Shock for around a quarter damage, going down to Iron Head. The same happens to Hatchram and Gotharita, leaving just Ponyta to Iron Head just as well. See ya, Chump. Hope you enjoy your gym challenge disqualification. Why the f*** did you do that? So, there's not much between here and the Battle Unleashed gym, but there is a pretty easy gym, at least. <laughs> yeah, there's really nothing here. However, this gym's gimmick is kind of neat, at least to make sure that my Pokemon don't die. Since whenever you answer Opal's questions correctly, including in the battle against her, I get some stat boosts, which is pretty nice. It also doesn't help that she uses Fairy types, a type inherently at a disadvantage to steal. She leads with a Galarian Weezing, which doesn't have much of a way to hurt Excadrill, so I just set up Swords Dance, then get a plus two speed boost from Opal's question, maxing out at plus six attack with two more Swords Dances, then sweeping the rest of her team with Iron Head, taking out Weezing, Mawile with Earthquake, since Iron Head wasn't gonna really do much, Togekiss with Iron Head, and of course, Gigantamax Alchemy with Iron Head, giving me the Fairy Badge. Five down, three to go, and the next one shouldn't be all that rock hard either. Eh, that pun was breaching too far. Straight after the gym, before Route 7, is yet another fight with Hop. This game's got quite the number of rival battles, but with this changed up team, it's really not that much of an irritation like it would be in black and white with the bouncing of Charon and Bianca. This time he leads off with Trevenant, so I go for Lucario, setting up a Calm Mind while getting hit with Confuse Ray. This is negated thanks to my held person berry, letting me go for Psychic for over half as he goes for another one. Well, I guess that plan wasn't as solid as I was hoping for, but Psychic is able to hit through Confusion for the KO, leading him to heat more. Well, uh, this is a bit scary, but I still go for Aura Sphere since this thing has garbage special defense, and it connects, taking it out and leading into a Teleon. Confusion still hasn't been able to affect Lucario as it's able to land another Aura Sphere, nearly KOing as Inteleon lands a tearful look, lowering my special attack back to normal as Lucario snaps out of Confusion, hitting one more Aura Sphere for the KO. Last out is Bolton, who goes down to two Aura Spheres, landing a light spark but nothing too damaging to make me worry, winning me the battle. Seriously, I can't put over these battles enough with Hop. Despite him basically being British How, the very teams are really dope. Route 7 and 8 are nowhere near difficult, so I'm able to just run through them, arriving in Surchester, but I'm nowhere close to the level cap yet, so I just went back through Routes 8, 7, the Glimwood Tangle, and Route 6 in order to fight Skip Trainers for both their money and experience, getting up there and taking on Gordy's Gym. While we're going through here, I figured I'd address the fact that I'm still using Dewblade despite having a Dusk Stone. Well, this is because I'm an idiot. My brain was thinking, well, I'll have higher offensive stats with Dewblade compared to Aegislash, but that's only because I was looking at the Shielded Forms base stats rather than the Offensive Form because I forgot that there were two different forms. Yeah, my brain's dumb. This plays into this fight because, boy, Dewblade almost dies here. Gordy starts off with Barbarical as I go with Dewblade, setting up two sword stances as he takes it down to low HP with two Razor Shells, but I misestimate my attack stat, barely missing the K with Shadow Sneak. Thankfully, he goes for Shell Smash, lowering his defenses, increasing his offenses and speed, but it doesn't matter since plus four Shadow Sneak has priority, KOing on the next attack. Second is Shuckle, and I'm pretty sure that I can survive any attack from a Shuckle even at this low of HP, so I set up a third Sword Stance, taking it out with a single close combat and leading into Stonjourner. It sets up thanks to a priority Wonder Room, which just swaps everything's defense and special defense, which is more of an inhibition to his last Pokemon, G-Max Colossal, after Stonjourner goes down to close combat, since, you know, Rock types have better defense than special defense. Well, Hey, that would have gone a lot better if I had just evolved into Aegislash anyway and kept in the defensive form while setting up a sword stance. But alas, we live and we learn. Hey, guess what is straight after the battle with Gordy? I'll give you a second. 
Yeah, of course, it's a battle with Hop. The guy just never leaves us alone. But let's see what he's got for us this time. Well, he starts with Dubwool. I guess he's circling back around to his older Pokemon, or mixing them together? Well, we'll see as I lead with Dewblade, since he can't hurt me whatsoever, so I just set up four Swords Dances, as he uses three Growls to negate one of them, using a fourth before going down to Aerial Ace. One down and four to go as Snorlax comes in and goes down to a close combat. Third is Inteleon, Shadow Sneak takes it out, leading to a new Pokemon in Pincurchin, which doesn't stop me from taking it out with Shadow Sneak, but that's cool, leaving just Corviknight. It outspeeds and uses Drill Peck, not doing much to Dewblade despite being at minus one thanks to close combat, leaving me to KO with a close combat and win the battle. Well, there we go. Another battle down and another bit of progression complete. Speaking of progression, boy howdy did Route 9 inhibit me from that, since I was trying to figure out where to go and just kept circling around. Don't think I've ever done that outside of my first few times through Rock Tunnel, but hey, I guess there's always a good time for a new experience. At the end of Route 9 though, there's a battle with Marnie before I'm able to get into Spike Myth in the 7th gym, so let's get crushed by her thighs, I mean, crush her team. She leads with Lyperd, so I go for Lucario, setting up two Calm Minds as she sets up Nasty Plot and Torment, meaning I have to swap between moves. Fortunately though, I have Psychic, so I'm able to just do nothing, and continue to set up. But the problem here is that she has Sucker Punch, and she's really good at using Sucker Punch on the turns that I use Psychic. Fortunately, Leftovers helps alleviate this, and I'm able to set up Max Calm Minds, KOing with Aura Sphere as she runs out of Sucker Punches, leading to Scrafty. It goes down to Flash Cannon, leading to more Peko going down to Aura Sphere, leaving just Toxicroak to go down to Psychic. Perfect. Great play around Torment, and a straight up sweep. You love to see it. I was also getting rather close to the level cap with Dewblade, but fortunately, with this gym, I can swap my Pokemon out from the PC. But you know who didn't know that before entering the gym challenge? Me! So I decided to Eevee train both Durant and Ponyard, giving them the movesets of X Scissor, Iron Head, Rock Slide, and Crunch for the former, and X Scissor, Iron Head, Sword Stance, and Beat Up for the latter. I Eevee trained both of them in attack and speed since I just needed more sweepers. This took a few hours, but after getting them on par, I was able to rip through the spike with gym trainers, challenging peers at the end. I also made sure to have some great items here too, with Durant on Leftovers, Bronzong on Light Clay, Copperage on Leftovers, Excadrill on Soft Sand, Stunfisk on Metal Coat, and Lucario on the Black Belt. Pierce leads with Scrafty, so I go with Durant, taking the Intimidate, but that just negates the attack boost I get from Hustle. Egg Scissor does a little under half as Brick Break does a fourth after Leftovers, so I swap for Bronzong in the attempt to put it to sleep and set up screens, but it just wakes up real quick and uses Brick Break, so that wasn't exactly the smartest thing to do, but I do get to swamp back in Durant and get rid of that Intimidate, going for X Scissor again and KOing, leading to Malamar. X Scissor rips straight through it and KOs, leading to Obstagoon, but Obstruct will definitely KO here, so I'm just swapping into Lucario, nailing it with a quad effect of Aura Sphere, KOing and leaving just Skun Tank. The only tank that it has that can do anything to me is Sucker Punch, so I just kept setting up Calm Mind as I usually do to drain the remainder of the power points, KOing with an Aura Sphere and winning me the fight. Good try, Piers, but I guess that was going to happen when I have a ton of powerful bug and fighting type attacks against a Dark type leader. This leaves just the final gym leader in Raihan, and shockingly enough, there's no battle with Hop after Piers, meaning I can just go straight into the gym, take out the three double battles, trainers, before him. Which, by the way, in case you were wondering, Bronzong is literally the best Pokemon for double battles, leaving just Raihan and the final gym badge. He leads with Gigalith and Flygon, so much for being a Dragon-type leader, he's more of a Sandstorm team leader here, but that's fine as we get a special defense boost as well, thanks to the Steel typing being under the storm. I set up Reflect since Lucario can just Calm Mind for that second special defense boost, but Flygon is able to hit Thunder Punch before Bronzong sets up Reflect, doing about a third to Lucario as Gigalith sets up Stealth Rock. That won't affect me much, but next turn Bronzong's able to set up that Light Screen while Lucario goes for his second Calm Mind. With Flygon going for Crunch on Bronzong for a round of sixth, and Gigalith going for Body Press on Lucario, taking it to a little over a quarter HP. Since Gigalith is the th most threatening Pokemon on the field right now, and since Flygon's stuck on Crunch for Bronzong, I need to KO that Gigalith, or at least incapacitate it, so I double target it with Hypnosis and Aura Sphere. 
The latter manages to KO Gigalith though, so Hypnosis misses Flygon unfortunately after it landed Crunch, but that's fine since it's still stuck on Bronzong, and Leftovers are healing Lucario as Sanaconda comes out. I do the same double target on Sanaconda since I don't know what it'll do, but Aurasphere KOs as Hypnosis managed to miss again, leading to his last Pokemon in Duraludon. I'm looking forward to using this myself, but he Gigantamaxes it and breaks my rule, therefore I will break his face. Knight goes down to an Aura Sphere as Hypnosis finally lands on Flygon, putting it to sleep and letting me wail on it with Aura Sphere, nearly missing the KO, but that's fine as it's still asleep, so I'm able to blast it with another one, KOing and winning the fight. Perfect. Though the level cap only goes up by one since we don't have much to do before the Champions Cup semi-final rounds. Unfortunately, there's a route between here and Winden, which happens to have a few required trainers. This threw a little bit of a wrench in my plans, but that's fine as I didn't grind everything that I've got to the level cap. Not to mention, I'm able to capture Duraludon here to help me finish the route, but that still means that I had to do a little bit more shuffling than I would want to. I lost Steelix to the double battle right here before Winden, but that's also fine since I didn't have a plan to use it at all during the Champions Cup, so it doesn't matter. Getting there and finishing off the team for the semis, with Lucario on Leftovers, Durant on King's Rock, Bronzong on Light Clay, Excadrill also on Leftovers, Stunfisk on Soft Sand, and Dublade on Spell Tag. Yeah, it's not evolved, but don't worry, it will soon. Marnie's up first here, and she starts with Lyperd, so I go with Excadrill and match her nasty plot with Sword Stance, using another as she uses Snarl for less than half, lowering my special attack, but that doesn't matter as next turn she wastes the turn with a second nasty plot, giving me a free turn to KO with Earthquake. Scrafty's up next, and I outspeed, nailing it with Earthquake and taking it out, with Toxicroak coming out and going down to the same. It goes for Sucker Punch with her light damage though before, making me wish that I had gone for a third Swords Dance, but hey, we're still doing just fine. More Pekka is the second to last out, going down to Earthquake, leaving just Grimmsnarl. She Gigantamaxes this monster, but that doesn't mean jack all against an Iron Head, and since it's Fairy type, it goes down to some massive super effective damage, winning me the first of two matches. Man, it's so cool that they got the inspiration for this whole tournament from WrestleMania 4 where tournaments originated. Definitely was invented by Vince McMahon, you can't tell me otherwise. Before the second match though, I finally got the 200 IQ idea to evolve Dewblade with the Duskstone into Aegislash, replacing Aerial Ace with King's Shield since I don't think I'll be needing it for the remainder of the game. Hop starts out once again with Double and has literally only one way to hit me and that's with Zen Headbutt. It does barely anything, so I'm easily able to set up three Swords Dances, KOing both it and Snorlax with a close combat each, leaving just three Pokemon remaining. First up to bat is Pincurchin, going down to Shadow Sneak, with Corviknight filling in and getting beaten down with close combat. Last out is Inteleon, which he Dynamaxes, but it still goes down all the same to a single Shadow Sneak, winning me the battle. Sorry buddy, I guess Aegislash is indeed too overpowered. Unfortunately though, we're not going to be able to jump right into the final rounds, so we're going to have to go have a nice meal with Leon and Hop first. But apparently Chairman Rose wanted an impromptu meeting with him about the darkest day. This kind of pisses me off. I'm hungry after a bunch of battles and this bastard decides it's a good idea to delay my plans, so I kick all of his goons' asses, including his secretary, Oleana. She leads off with Frostlass, so I go for Lucario, setting up three Calm Minds through Will-O-Wisp, Hex and Double Team before I blasted it with Psychic, KOing and leading into Salazzle. Fortunately, Leftovers are negating the burn, so I'm able to keep blasting her team, taking out Salazzle with Psychic and leading into Milotic. It's able to survive a plus three Aura Sphere due to being like the bulkiest thing on the block, but that's fine since I also have my special defense boosts, barely taking any damage from Surf before taking it out with a second Aura Sphere. Fourth on the docket is Serena, so I go for Psychic, barely missing the KO as she goes for Acrobatics, taking Lucario down to literally 8 HP. I about had a heart attack here, forgetting that Leftovers activated before burn damage, so that saved me as I finished it off with another Psychic, KOing and leaving just Garboder. She Gigantamaxes, but Psychic is still able to put her away, winning me the fight and letting me get to my meal. One good sleep later and it's time to take out the finals. I'm able to get my entire team to level 55 in preparation, getting a bunch of high yield EXP candies from the wild area before going in with this team. We should be in good shape, especially now that I can finally use Bisharp. 
First up is Bede, apparently who has been reformed thanks to Opal becoming a fairy trainer over psychic types. And guess what? That makes him much easier to pummel because he's using things that are weak to steel types. He leads with Ma while, so I go with Lucario, absorbing the Intimidate and going for two Calm Minds, taking two Play Roughs for the close KO, but not quite, and that's fine since it goes down to Aura Sphere leading to Gardevoir. We're in pretty good shape thanks to the leftovers, but we're able to outspeed, nailing Flash Cannon on Gardevoir and Rapidash, healing even more and KOing both, leaving just his Gigantamax Hanarin. This thing is uber slow though, so I'm able to blast just one more Flash Cannon out, KOing and winning the fight. Alright, one down, three to go, and first up is Nessa. Oh, you bitch, you killed my Pharaoh Seed. I will break your spirit. She leads with Glycopod, who has Sword Stance like my Aegislash does, but I'm able to still set up all three while surviving through a few Shadow Claws. Getting down to low HP, but thanks to Leftovers and King's Shield, I should be fine. Shadow Sneak KOs it, and here comes that bastard Barrascuta that killed my Pharaoh Seed earlier. King's Shield was in order so that I could get more Leftovers healing, KOing with Shadow Sneak again next turn, and leaving just three more of her Pokémon. I have nothing against her Seeking as it went down super easily as a Goldeen, and sure enough, after a King's Shield, I'm able to KO it just as well with Shadow Sneak. Pelipper and Dreadnought are all that remain, and thanks to the latter being her Gigantamax, Pelipper's out next, and I'm not allowed to let this thing set up Tailwind, since I need to smash Dreadnought with a non-priority close combat. So, I skip out on King's Shield to KO with Shadow Sneak, with Dreadnought going down as planned with close combat. Get out of here, I never want to see your face again. Bee's up next, and she's not too bad as she starts with Hawlucha, which barely has a way to hit Aegislash, with basically Bounce, a two-turn move that will be easily blocked by King Shield. So I just alternated Swords Dance and King Shield for three turns, firing off Shadow Sneak after getting to plus six, KOing, and doing the same to the rest of her team, as Surfetched, Phalanx, Graplocked, and Gigantamax Machamp all go down to one Shadow Sneak apiece, leaving just one more battle here. This one's against Raihan, but this time in a single battle, so it's cool that I'm going to have a little bit of a different dynamic here. He leads with Torkoal, setting up Sun with Drought as I go for Excadrill since he changes the weather up a ton, going down easily to Excadrill's Earthquake and leading to Turtonator. He tries going for Shell Trap, but thanks to it being like Focus Punch, it doesn't go through until I've connected, so it goes down in one shot with Earthquake before managing to land an attack, with Flygon following up. Since his AI is programmed to always go for the weather move, he goes for Sandstorm, letting me get up a Sword Stance and KO next turn with Iron Head. Two more remain, first of which being Gudra, and even though I think I know how the AI works, I don't want it setting up Rain Dance, so I just went straight for Earthquake, KOing and leaving just G-Max Duraludon, going down to Earthquake just as well and winning me the fight. Sorry bud, in single, double, triple, rotation, inverse battle, it does not matter, you do not have a shot at beating me. Now that we're done with that though, it's time for the champion battle, but that meeting earlier with Rose had more than meets the eye, with him triggering the darkest day and being unable to control it. Should have waited until you were dead and let someone else handle it, but start building the technology to control it, but no, you're a complete and utter idiot who decides to trigger something that could possibly destroy the entire region. Hope you're prepared to be smashed by the better steel type user. Well, after like two hours of training. Since the new level cap is 65, I trained up to 63 for this fight, which should put me at a really nice advantage. Rose leads off with an Escavalier, which is threatening to most of my team, but starting off with Aegislash, I can set up a Sword Stance as he does the same, and with him going for Drill Run next turn, I went for King's Shield, lowering his attack by one stage since he made contact. This doesn't cause him to use another sword stance, sadly, like I thought he would, so when I go for my own second sword stance, a drill run does around two-thirds damage since it's still plus one. So I figured it was high time to go out for close combat, KOing and getting some more leftovers healing before the next Pokemon comes out in Berserker. I figured I'd do the same thing as I've been doing the last few battles, doing the alternating King's Shield and Close Combat or Shadow Sneak, and getting that Leftovers healing, KOing Berserker with Close Combat and leading into Kling Clang. This thing's faster, so of course I need to use King's Shield to get it to minus one, since it uses Assurance after getting its attack lowered. Leftovers is coming in really handy since that did a little bit of damage along with that shield form, so it goes down to close combat next turn, leading to Ferrothorn. 
I still have enough HP to survive Iron Barbs as well, so another King's Shield in close combat later, and all that's left is this G-Max Caparaja. Despite its massive HP and defense, it's still a one-shot with close combat, winning me the fight. I didn't want to use King's Shield there, since of course, G-Max Pokemon can break through Protect and do, I think it's a quarter damage, but I don't quote me on that, I didn't research it. It's not over yet though, since I still have to take care of Eternatus, and this single battle against it, its regular form is really easy thanks to Bronzong's Light Screen and Excadrill's Earthquake, but the Eternamax battle is quite the difficult thing. I basically just let Zacian and Zamazenta slam themselves into this thing over and over again, keeping up dual screens with the Light Clay and landing on Death's Door with a few Pokemon, but none of them actually went down fortunately, leaving just the champion battle himself. Of course, before going into it though, I'm able to edge up to the level cap before challenging him. I feel pretty confident with the team of Duraludon, Lucario, Bronzong, Aegislash, Excadrill, and Bisharp, so I think I can do it. Here's hoping I don't get destroyed. For the first time ever this run though, I end up getting into a bit of a mirror match, as both of us lead off with Aegislash. I go for Sword Stance first since I expect him to go for King's Shield, and sure enough he does, giving me plus 2 attack for free, but next turn he goes for Shadow Ball. I know this can't KO, so I just use Sword Stance once again, going down into red HP but getting to plus 4 attack. Now I've got my setup in the bag though, I need to again alternate between my attacks and King's Shield in order to get that leftovers recovery. So I just went ahead and took out Aegislash with Shadow Sneak and leveling up the entire team thanks to that EXP spread. Second out is Cinderace, so our starter choice is finally coming into play and immediately leaving play as Shadow Sneak hits the metaphorical Pele kick over this goalie, taking him out and leading into Haxorus. I really do love this Pokemon, but again, alternating King Shield and Shadow Sneak is enough to put it down with Seismitoad taking the mantle fourth. I do the same again, taking it out with Shadow Sneak and King's Shielding and restoring HP, doing the same with Dragapult as he sends in his last Pokemon in Charizard. While that sweep was amazing, it does unfortunately end here, as we're going to need to do some heavy sacking to get through this Gigantamax. Shadow Sneak is able to do half his HP, but G-Max Inferno takes out Aegislash. So long my friend, you will be missed and you put in a ton of work. I sent in Bronzong second, but even the massive special defense and EVs that I've given it aren't enough to hold it back from one-shotting the G-Max Inferno again, leaving just one more turn of G-Max Charizard. I decided to go into Excadrill third since it outspeeds, which in hindsight would have been a good idea to go into second, since Leon apparently can't use items while Jarzard is Gigantamaxed, meaning I could have used Poison Jab to bring it down into red last turn, bringing in Bisharp or Lucario this turn and KO it from there, but alas, hindsight is 2020. I hit Poison Jab with the lax G-Max Inferno taking out Excadrill and draining the last of Leon's big boy. That's fine though, as I'm able to send in Duraludon. He goes for a full restore as I go for Dragon Claw, doing exactly half, and hmm, where have I seen this before? Needing a range on a fire type to KO? I guess that's just the way, especially because I missed the range with Dragon Claw missing the KO as he one-shots with Fire Blast, even though it was only neutral thanks to the dragon typing, but then again, Duraludon's special defense is pretty miserably low. Two of my team left, so I just went into Lucario, and to my surprise, he doesn't have a second full restore, letting me go for Psychic, pick up the KO, and the championship for only my second time in Galar. I'm gonna admit right now, this was fun, but holy crap. Playing through Pokemon games, not on an emulator, is something I do not like doing anymore, exclusively because I've gotten so used to speeding up, or using PK Hex and a bit of math to save time on grinding, and... If I come back to this game, I'm 100% using Yuzu in order to ensure that I can do that. Since I've got a pretty high-end PC, that shouldn't be a problem, but I definitely still had a lot of fun nonetheless. The battles had some good variation, since it was surprising to see such an early gym leader in Kabu have so many fully evolved Pokemon, like Ninetales, Arcanine, and G-Max Senescorch were probably the biggest threats in the run. But overall, I think I have a much more positive relationship with this game after this run, and though it still has many faults, all games do, some more than others, and I can't knock it nearly as much as I have before. Since it's not a game that bores me, therefore it's a game that doesn't fail. Anyway, next time on the channel, after a few more legendary speedruns, I think I'm going to head back into the Nuzlocke territory and finish up that Ultra Sun Nuzlocke race that I had going on with Flygon HG. He already uploaded his video, so I know exactly how well he did, but you'll have to check out my video to see if I can beat him.
If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, click the bell, tell a friend, and don't spend more than a minute doing that, since if you are, you're taking too long. I want to give a huge shout out to my $10 and above patrons, Justin Dimenstein, Zachary Kiever, Aaron Reinsmith, Aiden Brannon, Alexander Abdi, Andy, Casper Kirkpatrick, Heimflo, Jacob Johnson, Kyle Campbell, Michael Evans, Phoenix Fire, and Zeno. Thank you guys so much for your support. And if you'd like to support as well, you can head over to my Patreon page, link in the description, where you can get access to stuff like videos early, an exclusive role in my Discord server, link also in the description, challenge requests, and much more. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to watch this, and I'll see you guys next time with another challenge. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you next time.